Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethel. We've still got folks um, coming in from Sunday school, uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Please stand as we get started with Mighty is Our God. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to Power and love as we sing. 
seated. Well, it is good to see you in the house, um, in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, hopefully, uh, you set your time back uh, like you were supposed to. Otherwise, you're going to be messed up all week. Um, but it was good to see you. Uh, we did start Sunday school this morning at 930, and I think a bunch of you um, were able to make it for that. Please continue to be patient with us over the next couple weeks as we kind of figure out parking and getting people in and out and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so thank you for that uh, grace um, as we continue to do that and, and kind of figure out as the two churches pass. We haven't had to do that for 18 months, so uh, we're going to have to get used to that again. Um, also, one, an, uh, any announcements from your end? I don't think so. All right, one announcement for praise team. This is kind of an impromptu. We're going to do an all praise team practice um, Wednesday, if you can make it, um, so that we can start uh, working on Christmas music. So we're, we're getting close to that. So um, have a few things that we need to work on. So please stand as we continue with our worship with Seek Ye First. us. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise of our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Let's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Sorry, sky. I shall. 
shall bring my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. put a new song in my heart. And then we sang an old hymn, which for many becomes a new song. But I hope he placed it in your heart today. That melody that speaks of Jesus. As we come to this time in our service, when we stop and take just a moment to lift up our voices to our Father in heaven and pour out our heart to him. I would just invite you to come to the altar if you like or to be seated or to gather with a few uh, that you're comfortable with and pray with them. Let's pray this prayer together this morning. I'll read Psalm 119. Starting in verse 169, this is our prayer today. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you, and let your judgments for I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Father, that is our prayer this morning, that all that we do, that we seek after you, and that we hear because we've asked, and we continue to seek, and we continue to knock. Thank you for hearing our prayers. That is why we continue to exalt you, Father, because you are worthy of our praise. And I exalt thee.
Well, good morning. How is everyone today? Refreshed? Rested? And ready? <sighs> okay, I'll slow down. I'll bring it down a notch. Hello, Georgia. I think Georgia had another birthday since she was here last. I'm not positive of that, but we welcome Georgia back. I welcome all of you this morning. There are some that I just, they just move me when they show up because of, of their, uh, just what's going gone on in their life. And so we just thank you for uh, your faithfulness. I know Georgia's been praying for me even when she's not able to be here, and I know that, and I sense that, and I thank you for that, and I know others do as well, and I thank you for your continued prayers for me, all right, and for others in our family, okay? So I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Does anyone believe me? (laughs) I am going to strive mightily to stay up here, okay? I, it, it might become necessary because I'm just, you know, I'm going to try to stay up here, and if I start to go, all right, you have permission to say, whoa, all right? It's not the going down that's been the problem for me, it's the going down. Right? You guys know that. So I'm going to turn over a new leaf, and I'm going to try and strive mightily to just stay up here because that will allow my wife to hear in a calmer spirit. She worries about me. All right? She worries about me. I'd swear I'd be upset if you didn't. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 this morning is our text. As we work our way t- toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and if you remember back in the early part of July, I read to you the entirety of the best you heard on that day the best sermon ever preached in any pulpit at any time the entirety of the sermon on the mount from start to finish without any embellishments because it needs none but as we've worked our way through that we've seen a lot We've been, I've been challenged by Jesus' words, and I hope and I trust that you've been challenged by Jesus' words as well. We're going to come to the end, really, of his most practical teaching today, and then he's going to give us some, some kind of some follow-up words that you're going to really want to hear uh, next week. 
Uh, and so I'll, I'll just give you a preview of next week. Uh, Brother David Loveland is going to be here, and he's going to, to bring the message next week. So just know that. I'm, I'm excited about that. This will be his first uh, opportunity and time that he's going to take to, to preach uh, following his uh, cancer surgery, and he's recovered enough to the point now where he is able to do that, and so I've asked him, I asked him back early, and he wasn't ready yet, and so he is ready. I'm going to be um, uh, out next week, so David is, has, has uh, uh, graciously uh, agreed to, to come and bring the message for next week, so he's going to carry on uh, w- with the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, or part of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. But today's topic is what I would call, uh, or this this passage that we're going to look at is the second half of what I call a bookend passage of Scripture. A bookend. What do I mean by that? There are certain Scriptures, as you work through the Bible, that they begin with a doctrinal statement or a behavioral statement, and then they end with a doctrinal statement or a behavioral statement. Normally, it's the doctrinal statement at the beginning and the behavioral statement at the end, and in between is a lot of instruction on how to get from the doctrine to the behavior. They this middle section or the teaching section, it really helps me to understand how to live out that doctrinal statement from the beginning. They're easy to spot. Typically, they're easy to spot because the beginning of the practice, this statement, most of the time begins with the word, therefore. So whenever I get to that therefore, I said, oh my goodness, here it comes, all right? Now I have to do something based on what I just read. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, is one of these bookend passages. Stand with me, if you will. We're going to read the second half. We read the first half last week of this bookend series passage. We're going to read the second half this morning. We're going to begin with verse number seven. Familiar words, familiar teaching that hit me and struck me in, a, in, in kind of a brand new way this week as I looked at this as a bookend. Matthew chapter seven, starting in verse seven, Jesus says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and and you will find, knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or, if he asks for a fish, he will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who seek him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law of and the prophets. So Father, I pray you would bless the reading of your word this morning. You would open our eyes and you would open our ears and you would open our hearts to your message this morning through your servant. Thank you for Jesus who said these words and gave us this teaching. Amen. You may be seated. So we have these bookend passages of scripture stuck within the, the pages and, 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 and chapters and verses and, and paragraphs in, in Scripture. Now, I think you know, and we've said this before, that originally the Bible was not broken down into chapter and verse. It was just one long manuscript. Uh, 
written by the different authors, all right? The, the editors and the translators of the Bible broke down for our benefit, all right? It really is for our benefit. But it really is of, of great benefit to us as we read the Bible to be able to kind of focus in and, and find these blocks and paragraphs of thought so that we can better understand what is going on as we make our way through scripture. There's a lot of pages, there's a lot of words, there's a lot of different author, authors. It was written over a long period of time, but there's only one common thread. That common thread being the, 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 the redemptive story that God put in place for man to have a relationship with the Father. The common thread from Genesis to maps. It is there. It is evident. But as we read, if we were to just read through that, it was some, there, there are some difficult places that we would get if we don't have these breakups in, in paragraphs and chapters and, and verses. So the, the, author, the, the translators and the editors did that, and we benefit from it greatly. Even within the Sermon on the Mount, all right, three chapters, 112 verses, the Sermon on the Mount is broken down into, at least in the Bible that I'm preaching this series from, it's broken down into 22 different paragraphs. And they range anywhere from one verse to 11 verses. Each of those, what we, what, and, and many of them you've seen because we've kind of, I've kind of preached on each one of those in a separate way. We kind of break them out and pull them out and say, Jesus is teaching this here. Jesus is teaching this here. Well, the danger in that is we can say about a certain passage of Scripture, Jesus is teaching that here, and then we kind of tell ourselves that's the only thing Jesus is teaching in that Scripture. And that might not always be the case, and that's where I want us to look this morning. Because the first 12 verses of chapter 7, as I said, it is a bookend passage of Scripture. Chapter, chap, verse 1 in chapter 7 says what to us? Judge not, lest you be judged. And we all love that passage, especially when we can throw it at somebody. Right? We don't necessarily like to hear that, but we love using that. So verse 1 says, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, verse 12 says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, in some Bibles, verse 12 is a standalone. But it can't be a standalone. Why not? Because there's a therefore, all right? It cannot be a standalone thought because there's a therefore. And every time there is a therefore in Scripture, you better look at the verses before it to see what it's there for. So verse 12, which is the golden rule, do unto others what you would have them do unto you, we, always, we quote that verse as a standalone verse, but it's not a standalone verse. There's a therefore in front of it, which means there must be something ahead of it, right? Well, there's, there is. There's 11 verses ahead of it, and it starts with verse 1, which says, judge not, lest you be judged. Then there's some teaching, and then verse 12, do unto others what you would have them do unto you, right? So, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, judge. If you want to be judged. But he said in verse 2, you don't want to be judged. Because you can't handle it. 
So we want to judge, even though we don't want to be judged. And so we work through verses 1 through 12 as this bookend passage of Scripture. So how do we live out verse 12? We live out verse 12 by looking at 1 through 11. Today, we're going to look at 7 through 11, okay? Because last week, we looked at this doctrine, the doctrine which is found in verse 1 of judge not, that you be not judged. But then we got to verse 6, and verse 6 is that verse that says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest any trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. All right? Well, verse 6 is kind of this middle piece that says, You can, you, you are, verse 1 says, Don't judge. And then it says, Why? But then verse 6, it gives us permission if you will, to judge as long as you've done verses 4 and 5. Okay, it's, it's all there, but you get to verse 6, and it says, do not give what is holy to the dogs. In other words, don't just, th- there comes a point in time when as you're presenting the gospel, this was our message last week, as you're presenting the gospel and you get to that place where you must confront someone with their sin and they really push back hard against you and they push back to the point where they're actually reviling you or they're blaspheming against God, at that point your discernment is supposed to kick in and you can then at that point you can and you are supposed to just stop and leave them in their sin to God. That was verse 6. How do I know when to do that, why to do that, and how to do that? How do I practice verse 6 Knowing verse 1 says, judge not. Verse 12 says, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Let's work through it. Because I offer you today, in verses 7 through 11, what we commonly pull out as a standalone teaching, and we love verses 7 through 11. We love to claim verses 7 through 11. Just ask and seek and knock, and God will just give you all this stuff that you need. And I would, would say to you that what God is saying, what Jesus is saying in verses 7 through 11 refers strictly and solely and primarily, maybe not strictly and solely, but primarily to verse number 6. How do I, when do I, why do I ask, seek, and knock? Let's first look at the, what is it that we're talking about. Verse 6, again, says, do not give what is holy to the dogs. When you come to a place, when you're presenting the gospel to a person that just shuts you down, repeatedly, violently, blaspheming God, does not want any part of it, we then shift from talking to just living out the gospel to living Jesus before them, and we stop talking because our words are having no more effect. At that point, we, we, we must say, well, how do I know whether it, this is a person to do this or this is an opportunity to do that? We ask, we seek, and we knock, and we ask for this thing called wisdom or discernment. We'll get to discernment in a second. We ask for wisdom. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is the right application of knowledge. It is the, I would amend that to say it is the godly application of knowledge. There is wisdom, there is worldly wisdom that will not allow you to work in verse 6 very well. All right? My, my worldly wisdom in verse 6 means I'm just going to open your mouth and I'm going to continue to shove it down. I'm just going to continue to shove it down. And I can be just as violent to you as you can back to me with the words, and, and, we, can, and we can get into a big fight. You want to fight 
Jesus, we'll fight about Jesus. That's the worldly wisdom. And many of us feel like that's what we need to do, that I need to defend Jesus to the bitter end. Well, let me just give you a little thing right here. Is Jesus doesn't need you to defend him. God doesn't need you to defend him. The word doesn't need you to defend it. It is strong enough to stand on its own. We are to share it, proclaim it, lead people to love it, but you don't have to defend it. It's perfectly capable. God is perfectly capable of defending himself. And so the, the godly application of knowledge is, is what we will, we will use to know when to just stop. What, what, what are my examples of that? In 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, we see this is Solomon. He had just been anointed king. He had just been named king. And God met with him, all right, in 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon had an opportunity face-to-face with God. And here's the question God asked him, right? What do you want? Right here, right now. Anything. God put no conditions on that question. What do you want? What do you want? I think the Powerball numbers, right? I want the right, I want the right Powerball numbers. That's what I want. Why do I want the right Powerball numbers? Six hundred million for crying out loud! Come on. If we were honest with ourselves, if it was just you and me, or if it was just you and God alone in the dark, which it was with Solomon, and he said, "What do you want? What are you asking for?" 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 said, Solomon said, I can't do this, God. I don't know enough. I don't have any idea how to lead this people of yours. They are a rebellious people. I can't do it. Help me. Give me something from you called wisdom. 1 Kings 3, 7, and 8. It is Solomon asking for wisdom, knowing and admitting his need for wisdom. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4 through chapter 2 and verse 4, Nehemiah was going to go back to Jerusalem. He was a cupbearer to the king. He was a slave. He was just an ordinary man. Talked about that with teenagers this morning. He was just an ordinary guy. He was going to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. But in order to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall, he had to get permission from the king to do that. And in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4 through chapter 2, verse 4, you'll see in more than one occasion that the king, in his conversation with Nehemiah, that Nehemiah stopped in the middle of his conversation, and he just prayed, probably not real long, it was just as he was talking, and he prayed for the wisdom to know what to ask of the king. That's just an attitude of prayer, an attitude of prayer, an attitude of prayer. Paul says, pray always, pray without ceasing. That's what Nehemiah was doing as he was just everyday regular conversation. He was always in an attitude of prayer. James chapter 1 and verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, all right, and who is brave enough to say, I am, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask, and God will give it to you liberally, right? Now, many times in Scripture, that word if also means since. I wonder if, if, in James chapter 1 and verse 5, means since. 
which would change the reading of that completely, right? What does it say? Not if anyone lacks wisdom, but what? Don't say it out loud if you don't want to admit it. Since anyone lacks wisdom, right, let him ask, and it will be given to you, all right, in, li in liberal portions. So what it is that we're seeking is this thing called wisdom, this thing called discernment, this gift of the Holy Spirit. This really is, I believe, it, it is a gift of, from the Holy Spirit that my wife has in spades. And several of you have it. The quality of being able to grasp and comprehend what is obscure, right? What do we call it? Just the gut feeling, right? There's just something not right. I can feel it in my gut. And whenever my wife says that to me, I stop moving. Because she is not wrong. She is not wrong. And if I don't listen, if I keep moving, and I fall off the steps, it's because I didn't pay attention to the spirit of discernment that flows from the Father and the Holy Spirit through my wife. The quality of being able to grasp and comprehend what is obscure. If I look at it in, in the dictionary, it, there, there are a lot of synonyms for this word discernment. And, and one of them points to this thing called, it, it, what it says is it's a power to see what is not evident to the average mind. All right? or natural mind. So what is this spirit of discernment? It is something that is supernatural from the Holy Spirit. We are to ask, we are to seek, we are to knock on the doors of heaven for discernment. To be able to see and understand and grasp that which is obscure. And cloudy. To discern means to detect with your eyes. To see, if you will, the difference. What is, what is it that we're supposed to do? Ask, seek, and knock that which we cannot, for that which we cannot see. Open my eyes. Did we not sing that this morning? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. That's what it means to discern. We're to pray for, ask for, wisdom and discernment. But why do I need it? Why do I need this thing called discernment? Well, first of all, I need this thing called discernment so that if we go back to verse 5, I can see the blank in my eye. Because I don't want to see the plank in my eye. I just want to look at the speck in yours. Right? I don't want to deal with my own failures and faults. I just want to point yours out. I can see them. And I can be very critical. So I need this discernment, I need this wisdom to see my own plank. And if I then can see my own plank and then I can deal with that before God, then, then I can see to help my brother with their speck. We are to do that. Yes, six, verse 1 says judge not. Yes, it says that because when, when Jesus says judge not lest ye be judged, it's because we're judging with the plank in our own eye first. If we, as we come and we confess our own sin, as I 
am clean before God, then I can see clearly. Discernment is to, to detect with the eyes or to see or understand the difference. Right? Then I can see to help you as my brother. That's what verse 5 says. Deal with your own plank. Help your brother with his speck. But there is a definite order to how you can do that. And then we get to verse 6. I need that discernment and that wisdom so that I can recognize the dogs in verse 6. I can recognize those who are unwilling to hear and listen to and respond to the gospel. So that I can know when I am to shake off the dust. That is the why I am to ask and seek and knock. How am I supposed to do that? What does this look like? All right. First thing you must understand here, what Jesus is talking about. Jesus' message in the Sermon on the Mount was to a specific group of people. The specific group of people Jesus was teaching here was his disciples. Those who were choosing to follow him. Those who already had believed in him. In order to claim this promise, in order to claim verse 7, you must be a believer. In verse 7 of, uh, of, of chapter 5, of, of chapter five uh, uh, in, in, in verse 1 of chapter 5, seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and he went and, was, and, and he was, when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he said to them, and he taught them. Jesus is teaching his disciples. So this teaching about ask, seek, and knock is for his disciples. See, if you're an unbeliever, you cannot claim this promise. Now, that may sound like harsh words, but that is not, that is words that are taught in Scripture. You cannot claim this promise. Romans chapter 3, verses 11 through 18 tell us that. There is no one who seeks after God. No one can do this without first having come into a relationship with Christ. Psalm 14, verses 1 through 5. Psalm, uh, it's, it's Psalm 14, verse 1 says this. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Now, the word fool in Psalm 14, 1 does not mean someone who's dumb, someone who is stupid, someone who is unintelligent. It does not mean that. The word fool in Psalm 14.1 means someone who recognizes and understands that before a holy God, if he was to acknowledge that there was a God, he would have to live different. It is that person who has a moral problem and they refuse to recognize their own sin. It is said, the believer has said in his heart, not in his mind, in his heart, the seed of our emotions, the, the will. Because if he, would, if he would acknowledge God, he knows he would have to live differently. The fool doesn't have a head problem with God. He has a heart problem with God. 1 John 3 and verse 22 says, And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we are obedient so we must, first of all, we must be a believer, but we also must be living in obedience. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. Jesus says this in John 14 and verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will 
manifest myself to him, which means I will show up to him, which means I will walk with him and talk with him and help him, that person which is being obedient, as they go through life. We must live in obedience. <clears throat> so this morning, I was listening to, to a Tony Evans' broadcast this morning. I don't know if any of you all saw Tony Evans' the, uh, broadcast this morning. He's uh, introducing, uh, was really a conversation about a new book that his family is writing or has written uh, as a result of uh, the death of, of Tony Evans' wife and the children's mother. And, and it, it, it's, a, it's a book called Divine Interruption. I'm probably going to get it. I'm probably going to read it. Probably going to teach it at some point. But it's called Divine Interruption. And one of the things he talked about, I, 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 I had to, to look at that and, and add it even this morning because this thing about number two, this living in obedience thing, here's the thing about God's will. Tony Evans this morning spoke to two types of God's will for your life, okay? He spoke of his unconditional will, and he spoke of his conditional will, all right? God's unconditional will for your life is that which is just going to be done because God says so, and he can, and he will, all right? Those are, good, those are, those are going to be good things, all right? That is his unconditional will. But there is also this thing called his conditional will, which we, we have a hard time understanding, all right? Because we, we, we and, and I teach this, all right? So hear me clearly when I say this, this next thing. God's conditional will is, th there are parts of God's will for your life that you can keep from happening, or you can keep from being fulfilled by living in disobedience. God has a plan for your life. It was laid out from before you were born. All the days were written for you before there was even one of them. God has a plan for your life, and it is a good plan, and it is a straight plan, and it is a productive plan, but there are things about God's plan for your life that you can hinder God from fulfilling by living in disobedience. That is God's conditional will. He will if you will. All right? There are covenant promises and there are, or there are covenants that God makes, and there are promises that God makes. God's covenants are unconditional. His promises are conditional. Those are the things that I must do in order to receive the blessings. So I have to live in obedience. I have to ask. I have to seek. I have to knock with the right motive. James, J Jesus' brother, says you, you, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you might spend it on your pleasures. So I have to ask for discernment. I have to ask for wisdom with the right motive so that I can get rid of my own plank so that I can help with your speck, help you get back on your right path and to know when I need this discernment. I have to be submissive to his will. <sighs> but I want to do this. <sighs> have you ever asked God if he could just tweak his will just a bit to match it with yours? God, it really wouldn't be that hard. Because I don't think what I'm really asking you to do is all that bad. So I have to be submissive to his will. What does that look like? And in James, again, this, this brother of Jesus who was so practical in his, in his book, <clears throat> he says, if, if 
so, so God's plan for your life is a good plan. Do you believe that? I do. It's a straight plan. It's a productive plan. It's a plan that, that, that will, will, will do everything in your life that God has planned for you. But when we start to waver, James says to us in verse 7 and 8 of chapter 1, he says, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is a double-minded man. One foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. I'll do kingdom work when it's kingdom time, but man, I want to do this world stuff when it, when, 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 when it seems like it's the good thing to do or the fun thing to do. I saw that. We become double-minded. God wants us to be singular focused on him and on his will. So we must be submissive to his will. And here's the thing. I must be content with his will. I must allow his will be done. Did we not pray that in chapter 6? Did Jesus not say, this is how you pray when you pray this way? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, right? As, 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 as long as it's not too crazy, God. We don't pray that way. We don't pray that way. We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So then, if I pray that way, then I must be content that his will be done. And Jesus says, you ask you seek and you knock. And you ask and you seek and you knock. And we must be persistent in our prayers. This progression, if you will, if you see this, there is a progression to the intensity of asking. Mom, can I have a cookie? Is one way to get a cookie. Going and looking for the cookies in the cabinet is another way of getting a cookie. And banging on the pantry door when you know mom's in there is a third way to get a cookie. Right? Jesus said ask, and then he said go look for it, and then he says bang on the door, and he says keep on, the, the tense of these words is keep on on asking keep on seeking keep on knocking because the promise is what the promise is what ask keep on asking and what you shall receive uh, seek and you will Find, knock, 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 and knock, and it will be opened, right? Keep on asking. Let me ask you this question. Is whatever you're asking for, is whatever you're seeking, is this discernment, is this wisdom, is it important enough to keep on asking for? Is it important enough to keep on praying? And then Jesus closes out this section with the golden rule. Do unto others what you wish to be done to you. All right? <clears throat> and it's interesting that we see this because this is very this this ties very clearly and very cleanly with the second greatest commandment remember jesus was asked jesus was asked to test him right what is the the greatest commandment 
And he answered, of course, and he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right. What is he saying? Do this. Love your neighbor as yourself. He is saying then in verse 12 of chapter 7, therefore, because of everything we've already seen, because I've said don't judge, and because you've asked for wisdom and discernment, and you've, you've taken, dealt with the plank in your own eye so that you can help with the speck in your brother's eye, do what you wish to be done to you. And this is often turned around, it's often turned around to a negative way of thinking, right? Jesus is not giving us the negative way of thinking here. Jesus is giving us a positive, anticipate, you act first. You act first. You see, there's a big difference between I must do no harm to people and I must do my best to help people. You see, you can sit in, in the first part of that. I must, do, I must do no harm to people. Great. And you thought it was just the step that was the problem. Great. I'm not going to do any harm to people. See how easy that is? That's the negative side of Jesus' golden rule. You see, Jesus says, anticipate, and then you do it first. One commentator put it this way, only the man who can even begin to satisfy the positive form of the rule is the man who has the love of Christ in his heart. Are you thinking about how you can help people or how you can not harm them? See, Jesus' words are, do, be the initiator. That's the golden rule. And so we get to the end of verse 12, and what we find is that Verse 12, the golden rule of the Sermon on the Mount is it's actually the end of Jesus' practical living teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to get some more teaching, but the practical living, everything that we're going to experience over the next three years, I've just given you some, laid some groundwork. So Jesus has challenged his disciples to this point. He's challenged them to follow him, to walk, and to talk, and to act, and to live different. Jesus is challenging us today through these very same words, to walk, and to talk, and to act, and to live different different. He is challenging us to be salt and light. He is challenging us to be forgivers. He is challenging us and calling us to love people that we have never loved before. He is calling us, he is challenging us, he is leading us to serve and to pray and to have beliefs about God that are settled and sure. He is calling us to be examples of faith and trust in God and in His promises to you. Why? Because at the end of his time here on earth before he ascended to be the father he said I've taught you all of that because 
you are my witnesses. Go and make disciples. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you for showing us in your word how we are to live. But God, it wasn't just in your word how you showed us to live. You walked to this earth and you talked this on this earth and that is how you showed us how to live. Father, may we be examples in our world today and may we live out that which you've already taught us and as we continue to go through the rest of this book, Father, that we will see over and over and over again practical examples of the things that we're going to face that you've taught us in your word, shown us, warned us, if you will, in the Sermon on the Mount. These things will happen. Act this way. Say these things. Walk this way. And by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we go from here today, I would, would challenge you to live according to Jesus' words. That as you ask and you seek and you uh, knock for wisdom and discernment, that he, would, he will grant them to you. He will grant them to you. Walk in his path. Live in his promises. And you will be blessed. Let's stand and be dismissed. Have a great week.